Hello everyone and welcome to our next module, Dance and Religion. Remember that this course is a survey course. During our semester, we are going to look at varied dance forms and the history surrounding those dance forms. We are not looking at the trajectory of dance at its very inception and until 2021 because we would need a way more than a semester to cover that time. So we are doing a case study approach, if you will, looking at the history surrounding specific dance forms and how they relate to the communities that they are in. This next module is dance and religion. I also would like to remind you that each module contains, contains excuse me, a resource sheet that has links to additional dances. This is to continue your research, your learning experience by a offering you a, a treasure chest, if you may, um, of, of different dance forms. Um, because I know that you all have varied experiences with dance, but also have varied interests in what you would like to study. So this is my way of offering you a space to do some independent research and I also encourage you to interact with your classmates on the discussion board. Here's our module questions. These are the questions that you want to be able to answer by the end of this unit, this module. How does dance context help us to better understand dance? What are the four categories of religious dance based on purpose? This is listed also in your reading. Please make sure that you are doing the reading. What are examples of worship dances in America and in other countries? What is the definition of the term pagan? And what are some ancient attitudes towards religious dance? So this idea of attitudes, you had a reading already that began this discussion. So this is a reminder that the body is a medium for dance. And because it is the medium for dance, when you're looking at dance forms and you're looking at the communities and where these dance forms are coming from, they will be influenced by the attitude of the people that are doing the dance. What does that mean? If a, if a community, a culture believes that this pot body part is special, then their dance forms might um, highlight that body part. If, on the other hand, that they feel that this body part is unacceptable, is inappropriate, or otherwise, then they might not accentuate that body part as much. Some of these attitudes are based on religious beliefs. In your reading The Five Premises, we learn that anyone can enjoy dance, but there is a deeper understanding when you understand the culture that the dance comes from. Um, in this, to go a little further into this idea of understanding the culture, each culture, each community has its own values. So in that, they're going to have their idea of what is good dance, what is good art, what is bad dance, what is bad art. So the better you understand that culture, its values, its beliefs, its history, the more apt you are at being able to understand the, the art form that's created and the value it holds within that community. I also want to note that I do wear bangles and because of my cultural practices, I have to keep my bangles on at all times. So I do apologize if you hear them during the recording. Um, my microphone is a little sensitive. My headphones are sensitive to sound, so it might be picking them up. Dance is, to, is believed to have originated out of worship. So I want you to think back and, uh, or not think back, but I want you to begin to wrap your mind around the idea of movement as a function, movement as communication. And that's where dance was a part of worship. In your body, when you have an extreme emotional or chemical thing going on, there's usually a physical response, a stomping of the feet, a clapping of the hand. There is a physical manifestation of that thing that is happening internally. Dance is that thing. So it is believed that dance was 
a part of the worship process. Um, if I grew up Southern Baptist, so in a Southern Baptist church, when when there's a sermon going on, people clap, uh, people might sway while they're singing going on. So this this movement is what was the uh, the the birth to what we now know as the performance art. But it started from a very functional place of giving thanks to the universe. I also want to tap into the word pagan because language is a important thing as far as it providing access or denying access to a thing. So pagan gets used when we begin to talk about religions or when there's discussions about religion. And I want you to understand that pagan by definition is not does not mean does not have a connotation of negative or positive. It simply relates to any religious or spiritual practice that is outside of the main, the 12 main world religions. And the 12 main, even the use of the term main, it can be um, a little pigeon, create a pigeonhole. Uh, so in this case, think of main as numbers of people that are known to have to practice it, numbers of people that are known to practice these religions. So uh, that's where we get this 12 from. They are listed. Um, for some of us, this might be new that there are even 12 religions because we tend to know our culture, meaning our everyday life, because your culture is your everyday life, just like your diet is the way that you eat, right? Um, we know our life but not necessarily the lives of people that are that we don't interact with. So we know what our spiritual or religious practices are or not, but not necessarily what else exists out there. So the term pagan just re uh, refers to uh, these religions, um, and we just want to take note of that. So if pagan comes up in your additional research or in the readings, it means something outside of these 12. In your reading, there are four dances, four types of religious dances. And um, I like to, for me, it makes it easier if I connect the type to the function. So there are dances that serve as imitation, dances that serve as medicine, dances that serve as commemorative, and dances that serve as spiritual connection. So as you're going along, beginning this process of you being the dance historian, I want you to begin to think about as you see dances, which one for this module and going forward when we're in this module of dance and religion, which function do you think that this dance serves? And it's okay if it serves multiple ones because the world is not always uh, so separated that things only fit into one category. So some of these dances fit into several and just be able to explain why you feel like they fit into those categories. Some examples of dances listed in your reading are here. And I'm going back to the reading because I want you to remember that the reading is a part of this course. So the lecture will provide additional information from the reading, but you need both in order to be successful with understanding the content. With that being said, your responses to your TATs, your takeaway tickets, need to show proof that you engage with both the lectures and the reading. So you'll reference them in your own words, not plagiarizing, but you'll reference the information, the content in your, um, in your submissions. The first dance that I want to bring to your attention is the Wangala dance, and it fits into the category of commemorative dances. Whenever I am introducing a piece, because we're looking at the history, right, the story surrounding the dance, what was going on in society, what was going on politically when this dance evolved. So the history, the contextual knowledge around this dance, the who, what, where, when, and why, those five W's I offer whenever I'm stepping into a space of a dance form uh, to the best of my ability. So the what, what dance form is it? Wangala. Who were the originators of this dance form? The Garo people. Where do they live? 
You see that there. When is this dance done or when did it originate? It was originally done during the, the harvest time, which was between the months of September and December. But notice that I'm saying it was originally done then because culture is dynamic, meaning culture grows. Time happens. Things are um, informed by time and space. So just because something was done this way 50 years ago does not mean it's going to be the exact same. There might be some subtle changes. This dance is an example. It was originally done as the harvest uh, dance, but it's now since been added to um, parades and celebrations. So it's referenced and still done as commemoration to those things, as a... Um, acknowledgement of them. And why was it done? It was done to give thanks to um, to the goddess for a successful rice harvest. Now, this is a, I believe in practice, in repetition in order to build techniques. So the technique that you're building in this class is speaking and writing about dance. I would like to give you as much opportunity to practice that skill um, as possible. So this is your pre-writing task to help you develop the skill, but this also is not a official assignment. So you will not find a tat for this. This is like a practice for those of us who would like additional practice. All of us need to be writing these base lists, the body, action, space, time, and effort. But I want you to do one for the Wangala video. So this link is on your resource sheet. Just go through and see if you can do five lists. Go back for a second. So um, on this slide, you see two lists. But go and see if you can do five. Because if you can do five, then you have five lists, which you can then t use to generate five sentences. And those five sentences can be crafted together to make a paragraph. See where I'm going? So you're developing the writing skill. Once again, this is not a required activity. This is a, hey, do you feel like you need or would like some more uh, practice? Here's an opportunity to do it. Judeo-Christian beliefs, societal beliefs. Um, I'm coming at this angle because... Here in the U.S., which is where this course is taking place, um, Judeo-Christian practices are the, the primary means of spiritual practices here. So I am using this information to inform what's coming next. Not to say, yeah, I'm just using it to inform what's coming next. So there's a certain level of ambivalence around when and how dance should be done um, because once again, attitudes are based on the values and beliefs of a community or of a group. So while in my house, we might think that A, B, and C are fine, in another person's house, C, D, and E are fine, and A, B, and C are not. So these, um, these values are then perpetuated because if you grew up in my house, you're going to teach your children similar to how you were raised. And if you grew up in my neighbor's house, you're going to teach your children similar to how they, your, your children will be taught the beliefs that you pass down to them. So this creates various belief systems, various ideas, and various values. The, even within the Bible and some other um, Judeo-Christian religious books, there's a certain level of ambivalence about what dances are acceptable, when dance is not acceptable. Um, at the same time, we do see a certain level of consistency as it relates to uh, the Judaic religion uh, as practiced by uh, Hebrews and Jewish people where there was a certain level of consistency in them, uh, in this, in this belief systems, feeling that dance was okay. And it should be noted that even during the, during the European Renaissance, that a good number of the dance masters of that time were of Hebrew descent. Aristotle and Plato, 
offer a, a which were two Greek philosophers, and I'm offering this because specifically within our educational system and other subtleties of American life, it is still regulated by Greek philosophies and Roman philosophy. Uh, Aristotle and Plato actually have a great and wonderfully deep collection on dance theory and criticism that is still used today in discussion at I even when I did my master's in fine arts not too long ago um this was their writings were under discussion and if you look at the the time spans of their life listed at the bottom at, sorry at the top of the slide you see that this was many 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 moons ago but their words are still influencing how we live our lives today. They both agree that dance was powerful, but disagreed on how society should use dance. Plato believed that dance that should be graceful and athletic, but was more so referring to dances that prepare the body for war. Aristotle, on the other hand, thought that dance was corrupt and should only be used by slaves and foreigners. So it was okay to go to a performance and watch a dance, but it was not okay to be a dancer. As someone who is a professional dancer, I still see this in my life. When I tell people I am a dancer, they ask, well, what else do you do? Or what's your actual job? And it's so there's still this this idea of it's okay to watch a show, but it's not okay to be the performer in some cases. So I ask you, uh, where in history or in your contemporary life right now do you see traces of Aristotle or Plato's belief surrounding dancing? I shared with you my experience of telling people that I am a dancer and looked at as less than. But at the same time, I've made a successful career. So where do you see these traces? Rome. Under Greek rulership, Roman children were taught to dance until the guardians of morality, and they were literally guardians of morality, felt that this was okay. Uh, Cicero proclaimed that real men only danced when they were drunk or insane, meaning they were out of their rightful mind but it was okay for non-Roman slaves to be seen at the game. So still this idea of that you can watch the thing, but you should not be a part of the thing. But while Cicero makes this big statement that people begin to follow, soon after Cicero's death, we see the we see an influx in pantomime. Pantomime is a... Uh, is a gestural art form. Uh, pantomime in the European uh, countries is what lay, helped lay the grounds for classical ballet as we know it now. Not to say that all miming is done, originated from Europe, but just to say that the classical dance forms that we know now find their history there. The classical ballet, excuse me, that we know now has its history there. So in the fifth century, Roman African St. Augustine declared dance to be unholy, fifth century. But still, here we go with the ambivalence, even up to the 18th century, there were still cathedrals in Europe, in Spain, dancing. So even though there's this declaration that dance is not okay, there's still dancing going on, right? So this is it okay? Is it not okay? When is it not okay? When is it okay? Bands on liturgical dance. Liturgical, by definition, are dances that are used for religious practice as a part of religious ceremonies. Um, were were banned, and we see the highest numbers in hit for history. We see the highest numbers between the twelfth and the fifteenth century, but the dances were still going on. Like I said, in the 18th century, they were still dancing in the cathedrals. So while we have this number of raids and this number of people being caught and these intense bands, people are still dancing. 
it is believed that this is because there is a shift in uh, religious practice at this time. So the pagan dance forms, remember pagan meaning the dances outside of, uh, of the, those 12. At this time, we have, a, we have Christianity beginning to really take hold and become a major religion. The pagan dance forms, the older pagan dance forms, excuse me, the pagan uh, spiritual practices uh, still incorporated movement. So as the Christians come in and they are, as Christianity comes in and takes hold, there is a decision based on Plato and, and, uh, and other philosophers and their theories about dance. There is a, a shift to uh, not wanting dance. And people have to decide how to navigate. I want people to convert to Christianity, but they're still dancing. How do we stop the dancing? One of the things that happens during this time is that there is a, uh, a negotiation, if you were to say, where certain dances are allowed, certain, uh, certain formations were allowed if Christian practitioners could figure out a way to connect it to Christianity. So if we look at the formations of circles, circles can be the the ever presence of the the creator, the divine spirit, the circle of life. Um, those connections can be made. Also, dances that separated the genders. If the genders were not touching, then these dance forms were seen as okay and still allowed to be practiced. So what we begin to see, because there's this influx of Christianity in in Europe, what we what we begin to see is um, these clear lines being drawn. So dance in its older form was just a part of the religious practice. So when you felt the thing, you just went along with it. Now there's a discussion of well. What should you go with and what should you not go with? Which movements are okay, which movements are not okay? And it is believed that at this time or during the result of this discussion is where we begin to see a split between um, between dance, dance becoming secular and spiritual. So dances for, if you believe that the movement is still okay, dance is done, in, done as a part of the religious practice and dances that are specifically not okay. It's just movement just for your personal pleasure that has nothing to do with connecting to, um, to your belief system. I mentioned this term before, liturgical dances, dances of spiritual connection. Um, one of those dance forms is, or uh, let me go back and try that sentence again. This brings us to shakers. So a quick little blurb about uh, the shakers to give you that historical history, right? Because we want to understand the history around the dance form. We want to be able to document, we want to be able to write about the history of it. How did this dance form originate or what history about the society that it originated in? And then we also want to archive the dance by writing those um, base sentences and that base, which leads to that base paragraph. So the Shakers, the Quakers, are a product of um, the Protestant Reformation. So uh, Martin Luther nails the the thesis to the Catholic Church about what's what the issues with his issues with Catholicism in an effort to have a discussion but that discussion doesn't happen. What actually happens is a schism and the church begins to, to divide. So you have your Catholics and you have your Lutherans, the first uh, Protestants, Protestant protesters. This is why I say that language is very important. And then we begin to have additional Protestant religions. I was raised Baptist. Baptist would be a, a Protestant religion. Um, so these Quakers began in Europe 
and they migrate to the U.S. So I started with that European lens because I want to talk about America, but we have to understand what happened, how this group of people got to America and all of those things to better understand what's going on. So going with our, our five W's, the who, what, where, when, and why, you see who the Quakers are, it's the vision of the Shakers. Um, we see where they originally, how they originally ended here in the U.S. And this dance, their dance forms are a part of their religious practice. They are done during this, meaning that they're done during the service. And, uh, the Quakers and the Shakers, as they were, grew to become this sect of the group, began, be, ugh, excuse me, I'm trying. This group of Quakers got the nickname Shakers because they believed in allowing themselves to have this movement experience while in worship. This movement experience developed into what would later be choreographed dance forms, choreographed dances in worship. Continuing with ideas about the Quakers to give you a, a deeper view of their dance forms, right? They believed in the duality of the of the the supreme being, meaning that the supreme being was made up of both a female and a was was made up of a female and male energy. Um, they believed that Anna Lee was the second appearance of Jesus Christ. They believed in equality of between men and women, and they believed in celibacy. Community property, the withdrawal from the world, they created their own space. And notice that uh, worship is expressed in dance and in march, right? So that's how it connects to this dance. This is an extension of worship. So in tech number five, you're going to watch the video and you're going to create five lists. There are several dances done during the video, um, but treat the dances as one experience. Imagine that you travel to this village and this is what you documented. So in your submission, you are going to talk about uh, what you saw. You want to... Start by creating five lists. So look at a body, look at a, a movement, and you're going to break that movement down into its elements. Which body part performed the movement? Which action did it perform? Where in space did it happen? What was the tempo? What was the effort? That's one movement. And then look at another movement. Do the same thing. And then look at another, and then another, and then another. So you'll, you will essentially have broken down via a list five different movements. You're then going to you have that written down. You're going to go back and look at that list and then turn that list into a well-written sentence. It's going to be well-written because it has well-written defined as it has details, right? And those details will be those elements that you included. And then you're going to combine those sentences to make a well-written paragraph. This paragraph and the list that were used to generate the paragraph will be submitted on the Canvas platform. I'm going to say that again, reminder that you are submitting this on the Canvas platform via TAT number five. That's where you are, you're submitting it. That's how it, it will be graded. Additionally, I want you to look at other responses from, uh, from other class members. I've broken the class up into smaller like kind of chat groups. The classes are very large but I wanted you to, to understand that you are in this experience with some other people. So look at other responses. After you post yours, look at other responses and begin to think about, it says inform the professor of your group, but begin to think about who you want to work with don't really need to inform me, but begin to think about who you want to work with for the World Dance Project group. And that is it for today. This link is in the tag. Have a blessed day.